Hi, my name is Tony Ridley and welcome back to another crisis leadership and management education tutorial in this section we're covering priority decision making. Albeit somewhat obvious or straightforward for many individuals, priority decision making is actually a learned skill. It differs from standard routine and non-priority decision making in the essence that there are a number of outcomes that need to be achieved faster and fundamentally it requires a practice rehearsed and experienced system in order to achieve this so what we're going to be touching on here is some of those tools methodologies and processes to facilitate a rapid consistent and certainly replicatable process when it comes to making priority decision making one of the first aspects to consider before any decision making is a consideration of all of the factors or a factor analysis when it comes to the balance of consideration for such things that relate to our moral compass, um, the ethical standards and reputation within an organisation. And these are all of the things that constitute priorities, whether they be individual leadership priorities, whether they be organisational or department or directive priorities that have cascaded down from other authority or guidance aspects within an organization. So one of the first things, and I, I don't mean to be flippant with the moral and ethical, but this, there is always considerations as to not only your stand on a particular issue, but the decisions that you will have to make that will affect others. And the reality is that anybody who has been in crisis management or has been in a crisis um, of significant scale, magnitude or frequency will tell you that there is often life and death decisions that are made. Um, these may not derive from financial considerations or solvency for a business but in many instances that affect individuals, organisations, natural disasters, uh, terrorism, violent crimes and a bunch of associated aspects um, there will be, there certainly is the potential for life and death decisions. Now this is not to say that this is something that you can um, decide whether someone lives or die but certainly it's a case of prioritisation for uh, the individuals that have been affected. For example you may prioritise uh, the wounded and um, a disabled or affected individuals over those that have been deceased um, and as a result you may have a separate plan or a separate timeline for that but again uh, it's it can be everything from soul searching but certainly a factor analysis begins with the moral and ethical standards in particular the loss of life and I emphasize this is that the, the reality for many senior executives is that at some stage in their career they may well be presented with whether it be an accidental, whether it be natural causes, uh, whether it be the result of targeting natural disasters um, or specific violent crimes in the workplace, uh, active shooter, uh, there's all sorts of types of scenarios and even motor vehicle accidents. Um, can not only impact employees but also employees and, and personnel's families as well if there's an incident that occurs. Um, if for example everyone remembers the Boxing Day tsunami uh, where hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people were affected and hundreds of thousands of lives were lost, um, those sorts of things can certainly leave a significant imprint on both organisations but certainly individuals. The other functional aspect or the practical aspect is loss of function. The ability to function both within the organisation but also within teams. Teams themselves um, are often not assembled unless under times of duress. Um, routine general management uh, coordination teams are not always crisis management teams and even then there are s different aspects and considerations to take into account um, how individuals will receive information, how they themselves make priority decisions and how the group functions together. And this also comes down to the physical aspect of loss of function when it comes to businesses. It could be rights of, uh, it could be access, it could be the functionality of production lines, um, it could be vendors effect, affected, logistics, and a whole host of other things that you need to take into consideration before you have a final outcome or a course of action. You need to be able to ensure, or you need to be re relatively confident that it's uh, implementable. Uh, that, that means that you shouldn't be spending a whole lot of laborious processes and considerations and planning only to overlook something as simple as 
uh, that no longer works, that's no longer accessible, or an individual's not part of that key decision-making process. This goes hand in glove with the financial considerations. Um, your access to fi funds and financing, uh, your ability to uh, liquidate specific assets, your ability to get funds from one location to another, for example. Um, if you're an international or a regional organization and you need to transfer funds, um, there again, that may present an issue. How do you draw cash? How do you transport cash? Um, how do you protect cash? All of those sorts of things, uh, is cash no longer acceptable? You know, how do you barter? There's a whole host of other things that you need to consider from a financial perspective. And leading on from the moral and ethical aspects, irrespective of where your own personal stance may be, the legal and contractual requirements, um, both in real time, um, legacy agreements, and potentially after the fact in terms of litigation, uh, civil suits, um, duty of care, all of those types of aspects that affect you now but potentially could be amplified or brought into contention as a result of both your decisions and or the crisis and events that have taken place. And reputational for many organisations is paramount. In some instances uh, I've seen and know of individuals that are, that are far more passionate about their reputation than, than everything else. Uh, Warren Buffett's been quoted as takes 20 years to build a reputation, five minutes to destroy it. And nothing is more true when it comes to crisis and crisis decision making. Individuals and organisations may not be uh, to blame or held to blame for a set of circumstances, but certainly they will be judged and measured upon their decision making and results and the outcomes that they do or don't achieve. So this is a pivotal aspect to consider to make sure that you are aligned and consider the reputational aspects. Um, this could be a self-sacrificing process, the equity involved or the minority losses or, or the significant losses um, could be significantly more worth it in terms of a trade-off or the long-term sustained reputational uh, equity that you get as a res result. The shares and market positions, comments, uh, decisions, uh, personalities, timely releases, uh, methodologies, management, all those sorts of things have significant shareholder and market position, whether you're a publicly traded company or not, even privately held organisations and certainly small to medium enterprises are, are far more um, uh, disadvantaged or far more susceptible to these types of swings, particularly if it's a, uh, a consultative or a knowledge-based or a, uh, a small premium business where it, it literally does come down to a handful of individuals. If one or more are affected, uh, you could be an accounting firm that's embroiled in, a, in an audit uh, failure that's resulted in a multi-billion dollar loss for a large multinational. Um, if you are a small firm, um, or you have, have all been affected, then significant value could be lost as a result of um, your rather small footprint. Uh, large organisations may be able to sustain um, a smaller blip on the radar if it's a smaller percentage of their earnings or a subdivision of one of their businesses. Um, but the reality is customers, investors, uh, management, and even employees. Um, when it comes to employer of choice, these um, running through the DNA of all of the organizations is the, the moral compass and the, the perception or the understanding of how employees will be treated both in routine and fair times as well as crisis and difficult. Um, and these, these stem from uh, perceptions of voluntary layoffs or, or union type issues or um, unpaid leave. Um, all of these things can considerably weigh upon the reputation and the the loyalty and the brand and the reputation of a particular organization. So consider all of these factors um, long before you get to the point to affirming or, con or authorizing the release of any particular directive. Then identify, identifying the criticality of specific functions. What is it that you cannot live without? Now, hopefully this should have been considered and documented in your business resilience and business continuity. So you've got maximum permissible outages, maximum permissible downtimes. You've got criticality. You've got identification of priority processes, whether they be manufacturing, um, invoicing, you know, finance, um, uh, electricity, 
Um, all those sorts of things need to be considered and you certainly need to just do a, either a mental checklist, but as I continue to emphasize all through this, is to have some sort of structured checklist process or um, you know, flight check procedure to ensure that you have covered all of your bases before you get to a, a final start decision. And then obviously the center of gravity is a, is a term that is essentially referencing your tipping point. Um, at what stage can you either lose or reposition specific fundamental strengths of an organization before you approach a tipping point? Um, so if you do lose two or three or four or several of these areas and your reputation's been affected, you don't have the financial capital and there has been loss of life, will these events accumulate to a point where your center of gravity has now been displaced and you're tipping into a negative territory, much the same as a set of scales? As well as the survivability. Um, the survivability of in generic terms of survivability of a product or a service or a financial market or positioning, but also the physical sense of survivability of specific assets, uh, survivability of individuals, um, survivability of you know, entire communities. Um, all of these things, depending on the nature and the scale of uh, a crisis, need to be considered with your decision-making process. Because again, um, if unless you're a, a robot, unless you're extremely callous, um, then making decisions that affect individuals, communities, families, life and death decisions, uh, these things will weigh upon you, they will impact upon you, and certainly uh, they will change you and they will, they will uh, cause for pause, they will uh, affect your decision-making process and certainly your sustainability in being able to repeatedly make those type of decisions over and over again will affect you and your team. So the survivability comes down to the, the basic fundamentals of uh, the crisis management team uh, running is that if you have had a 9-11 or a Boxing Day tsunami or a terrorist attack and and or these events or an active shooter and, and all these types of events that have resulted in either loss of life or, or sizable loss of life, these in real time will affect your decision making, it'll affect the decision making of your team and it will certainly affect the direction in which um, you choose at times. Again, you need to be able to apply objectivity. You need to be able to take into that, uh, take those things into consideration and plan for it, um, or have inbuilt redundancies as part of your process to make it either or more automated, or to minimise or reduce the the emotional and physical uh, impact that they may have. And then last but not least, certainly the infrastructure and location at a specific geography. You may have lost bridges, roads, power lines, mobile communications, um, access to a facility. Your facility may be underwater. Um, there's a myriad of things that specifically, again, uh, need to be considered. How does this fit into the bigger picture? How will you plan around that? Does it fit with your original objectives? And is that in priority? If you've uh, got a simple one to four in terms of priority and people and reputation and environment and, and all of those types of uh, standard approaches, then make sure that you consider all of that before you implement or commit to any particular decision making. So that's it for the basic factor analysis and consideration when it comes to decision making on, on this section. Once again, thanks very much for joining us. For more information and more tutorials on this subject for crisis leadership management, please visit the website at www.crisismanagement.tony-ridley.com. That's all for now. Thanks and goodbye.